So we're just going to be looking at uh, the first six verses, uh, sorry, first five verses of chapter six in Galatians. We looked at uh, chapter five a while ago, uh, but we're starting a new uh, series this morning. And Galatians is all about grace, saved by grace, living by grace, all of grace, the grace of God, not treating us as we deserve, but gifting us salvation rather than us working for it but to merit it. Of all the things that are radical about Christianity, this is the one that really means that we're so different from all of the faiths. Because Christianity says that we don't earn a place in heaven by being good or moral, but it comes as a gift to all those who have faith in Christ, faith in his death on the cross to pay the price of sin. That's really what we've been seeing all the way through this book of Galatians up to this point. But as we've also been seeing, not everybody is happy about that message. A group of people has come claiming to be believers, and they've come to the region of Galatia, and they've convinced the Galatians that Paul, who wrote this letter, has not given them the true gospel. He's not given them the proper one. That Paul's gospel is deficient, and actually they need to follow the law of Moses if they want to be right with God, and if they want to grow in their faith. That's what the false teachers have been teaching in Galatia. And Paul, by the time we reach chapter 6, has demolished this idea that people are saved by keeping the law of Moses. But now he needs to show them what it means to live a life trusting in Jesus instead. If the Christian life is not about following a set of rules, then what is it about? And Paul has had to head off two wrong approaches. A legalistic approach, which is back to the law, uh, keeping legalism, uh, law keeping by uh, the back door, legalism, just with a Christian veneer. And the other is a sort of licentious approach, which says a Christian is sort of free to sin away uh, in whatever way they like without any consequences. The gospel in that way then becomes a license to sin. This is probably what the false teachers have been accusing Paul of teaching. So Paul has to head off both approaches. He has to show a third way, a better way than legalism or license. And what he shows them is a culture of grace. A culture of grace. The way of love. Through love, serve one another, he's told them in chapter 5, verse 13. Loving service of one another is the way to go. Avoiding flesh-driven actions and instead fostering spirit-grown attitudes, the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We learned that verse during lockdown with some actions, but I've forgotten most of them by now. Um, but they're good things to remember, aren't they? Those attitudes that the spirit grows in us. And now it's time for those spirit-grown attitudes, this culture of grace to meet the fallen world that we live in. So what does a culture of grace look like in a church in the face of sin, in the face of need, in the face of a dog-eat-dog competitive world? Well, that's exactly what he's going to show us this morning. And as far as I can tell, we still live in a sin, uh, sinful, needful, competitive world. So actually what he tells the Galatians is applicable to us too. We still face those issues of sin, need, and the temptation to compare ourselves with others. So let's see what God is teaching us through the Apostle Paul. First point this morning, sin meets a culture of grace. Have a look with me again at verse 1 of chapter 6. Brothers, if anyone is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. I want you to imagine that we've actually been hearing about King David this morning. I forgot that we were going to be hearing about King David, but imagine that we've got King David here with us this morning, but a bit later on in his life. He's a believer, but as King David did, he committed adultery with Bathsheba, an awful sin. And that sin has come to light, uh, and that's the sort of situation this verse is dealing with. We've got this person in our church. What happens in a church where legalism is a culture and you've got that sort of situation with King David? Well, I'll tell you what I think happens in a church with legalism. Gossip. 
judgmentalism, sneers. They start getting text messages with Bible verses from people that have never texted them before. It's mostly Exodus 20, 14, thou shalt not commit adultery. It's made very clear to King David that he's not welcome. This is a church, not a place for sinners. David receives a letter from the elders. His membership has been revoked. How dare he do something like that? Christians don't do things like that. Do you know what I mean? For that as a culture of legalism. Equally, though, what happens in a church where license is the culture? You know, the do as you like. Nothing much. Everyone knows it's happening, but nobody says anything. You know, judge not lest you be judged. So King David carries on in his adultery with the implicit support of the church and its leaders because no one will say anything. I hope you recognise that neither of those situations is good. And Paul has been arguing against both sides in the letter. No to Christianity as legalism and no to Christianity as a license to sin. So what's Paul's solution in a situation like that? What does a theology of grace, a culture of grace, do in those circumstances? Well, the sin is not to be ignored, but nor is the person to be unceremoniously kicked out. Instead here, do you see in this verse, the goal is restoration. If anyone is caught in his transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. The word there, restore, is katarzizo, okay? And it means to mend or to repair. So when you read what the disciples do when they mend their nets, that's the word that's used. So the goal here is not to destroy, but to mend. And it's to be done, do you notice, in a spirit of gentleness. John Calvin, the reformer, wrote, No man is prepared for chastising a brother till he has succeeded in acquiring a gentle spirit. Often in these sorts of situations, people want to go in with all guns firing, don't they? Especially the injured party. But Paul says a spirit of grace goes in gently. I remember hearing recently of a church where someone, a prominent member of the church, I think had shared something inappropriate online. The blogosphere and social media exploded in a call for this man to be immediately ejected from the church. And if not, then the church should be ejected from its church partnerships. Now that man, in my humble opinion, was wrong in what he shared online. But that's not aiming to restore the man in a spirit of gentleness, is it? That's the mob. So Paul is not saying that a church should be a pushover. Paul calls for the church in Corinth, for example, to put someone out of the church after they've been caught in gross immorality. But even then, the goal is restoration. He writes to them in the next letter in 2 Corinthians 2. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. Where there's repentance, where there's turning, the goal is restoration. You see, in this, uh, this person who has, has done this, I don't like the term victim, but they've been overtaken by sin. That's really what that word caught in any transgression. It doesn't mean that someone's caught them. It means that they've been trapped, ensnared. They've been captured, hoodwinked. It's not the idea that they've been found out. This person who you're dealing with is not an enemy, but a brother or sister who has been tripped, who has stumbled. They're someone in need of our help, someone in need of restoration. They need to come to repentance, but with the help of a gentle, loving person. Firm, but gentle. So who should do this then? Who should go to this person in a spirit of gentleness? Well, Paul's answer, those who are spiritual. You see that they're you who are spiritual. He doesn't restrict that to the leaders. Presumably they had elders and deacons like the other churches uh, in Galatia. But Paul says those who are spiritual. And he's just defined what he means by that in the previous chapter. 
those who keep in step with the Spirit, those who are characterized by love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, those who are avoiding the deeds of the flesh. And in that sense, that should mean any mature Christian, shouldn't it? It's not just the apostles or prophets, the pastors or elders. It's not super Christians or sinless Christians. It's just stable, normal believers. That's probably why he gives them a warning in the second part of the verse. Keep watch on yourselves, lest you too be tempted. The people who are helping restore this person are people who could be tempted too. Now, this has always seemed a bit of a strange warning to me whenever I've read this. Because, well, surely the point is that actually you're taking someone away from sin. How would that be a problem that you'd sort of fall into the same thing? But that would be to underestimate the nastiness of sin, wouldn't it? The craftiness of sin. Sin is so sinful that it can turn the very law of God into temptation. Don't covet, the Apostle Paul read as a younger man. Did that make him not want to? No, sin got hold of the commandment and made him want to do it. If sin can corrupt the very commands of God, can it not corrupt our desire to help one another? Could it not cause pride in us as we try and help? Envy in us as we see what someone has got up to? I know of people who have helped other people with marital difficulties. And then they've ended up having an affair with the person that they were trying to help. That's not the norm, but it happens. We need to be careful. Paul encourages us to help. But as we help someone, we must not be ignorant of the schemes of the devil who's out to trip us up, out to capture us too. We must be aware of the sinfulness of sin that would bring us down. So do help, says Paul, but go in with eyes open. So what actually happens to King David? Well, he was restored. He was brought to repentance in a pointed but gentle spirit by the prophet Nathan. You are the man, says Nathan, after telling him a parable. And David repents. You can read of his repentance in Psalm 51. He was restored. It could have gone very differently, couldn't it? If Nathan had pulled him up harshly and unfeelingly, he could have lost the ear of the king. He wouldn't listen to him. If he'd ignored the sin altogether, then David may never have been restored. He could have been lost like Saul. But God used the gentle but direct spirit of Nathan to bring about restoration. And a culture of grace will do that. But it's not always sin that's hard in life, is it? Sometimes life is hard for other reasons. We can struggle and be in need of help when we haven't actually done anything wrong. But Paul has something to say about that too. And so our second point. Need meets a culture of grace. Have a look at verses 2 and 3. Bear one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Here in this verse, we meet someone who is struggling. Someone who is burdened. Now, some people think this is linked to the verses before, that what they're struggling with is sin. Others think it's more general. I'm inclined to think it's more about general struggling. Because the burden of sin was borne by Christ. We can't bear the burden of sin for other people. However helpful we want to be, we can't bear that burden for someone else. What we can do, though, is help them through a difficult time. When people are struggling spiritually with, say, doubts or spiritual exhaustion or persecution. Or when people are struggling physically or materially with, say, physical ailments or infirmities or financial difficulties. Or when people are struggling emotionally, say with a bereavement or a struggle at home or a family problem. What does a culture of grace do then? Well, imagine we had someone in genuine need this morning here with us, like the man in the story of the Good Samaritan. Well, a culture of legalism will find a way round helping that person or will try and do the bare minimum. The Pharisees were experts at restricting the law, so it only did what they wanted it to do. 
Jesus talks about them weaseling out of support of their dependents by devoting it to God, so it sort of paid off their temple tax instead. When they did do something good, they made a big song and dance about it so that everyone would know. It was more about helping their reputation rather than helping the person in need. With the story of the Good Samaritan, the legalists pass by on the other side, don't they? Not wanting to become ceremonially unclean by potentially touching a dead body. Or at least that's their excuse for inaction. You can imagine, can't you, that these sorts of situations, they look down on struggling people. Struggling with doubt? Well, I'd never do that. Struggling with this issue? Well, I'd never struggle with that. That's what a culture of legalism does. looks down on those who are struggling. What about a culture of license? Well, a culture of license says, not my problem. We're not saved by works, so I don't have to do anything. I'm not my brother's keeper. I'm not under any law. Struggling with doubt? So what? Each to their own. Can you see how unfeeling it becomes? Just, just get on with it. It's not my problem. But what about a culture of grace? Well, a culture of grace says we are under a law, the law of Christ. A law which means here that we are to bear one another's burdens. What law is he talking about there? Well, it's summed up by Jesus in John 13 as love one another as I have loved you. The law of love means that we will bear the burdens of our brothers and sisters, that we will help to meet their needs, just as in Christ, God has met ours. Grace is God being generous towards us, isn't it? Gospelly. A culture of grace then is us being generous with others with our time, with our resources, with our energy, with our lives. You see, there's a danger that we view our time, energy, resources as somehow more important than the people around us, someone else's. My, far, my time is far too valuable to give to helping that person. Other people have far more time to do what I could do. That, well, what are they doing? Somebody in church should be doing X, Y, Z meaning somebody who's not me. Well, Jesus said it's more blessed to give than receive. And if we're serious about bearing the burdens of others, then we're going to have to give. We're going to have to be gospelly generous, focusing on how much we are giving out rather than how much we are taking in. You see, there are two ways of looking at church life, aren't there? One is that we're here to take. That person thinks like this. If you want me to stay at church, you better jolly well meet my needs. Here are my demands. Preaching like Spurgeon every week. Home groups with only people that I like in them. Plenty of people my own age. Leaders without foible or weakness. Counselling that solves my every problem. And if I feel my needs aren't being met, well, there are plenty of other places that would be honoured to have me. That's not a culture of grace, is it? That's consumerism wrapped up in gospel wrapping paper. The other way to take church is that it's there to give. That person thinks like this. How can I help the people around me at church? How can I be useful here? How can I look out for that person in need? How can I meet their needs? <coughs> the classic example of this with that sort of different thinking is hospitality, having people round. I remember having a conversation in another church, something, of the line, something along the lines of, I'm fed up with this church. Nobody invites me round for dinner or for Sunday lunch. So gently, I asked them how many people they'd invited round. None. But that's not the point. They should be inviting me. As an aside, it actually turned out they had been invited round places but not by the people they deemed important. <laughs> they were being cared for, looked after, but they viewed the people who did give them time not worth theirs. Strange, isn't it? They were guilty of exactly the same thing they were accusing others of. Anyway, that sort of they-should-be-doing-it-for-me mentality 
is why I think verse 3 is there. Remember verse 3? For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. If we have a high opinion about ourselves, it will be all about us, all about me, my needs, my burdens. Your burdens are secondary and not as important as mine. But, says Paul, that's deceiving ourselves. Instead, as Paul writes in Philippians, Philippians 2 verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Knowing that we're saved by grace alone and not from our own merit will keep us humble. It will help us view others as worth our time, worth our effort, because we'll count them as more significant than ourselves. But you might be thinking, well, who does that? Seriously, who does that, counting others as more significant than themselves? Well, Paul's answer in Philippians is Christ. Jesus did. Jesus counted us as more significant, put our needs ahead of his own. He bore our burden. And now he asks us to bear the burden for others. He says in Philippians 2, again, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus did it. He counted us more significant. Well, what happened to the man who was beaten and left by the side of the road? Well, he's helped by someone unexpected, isn't he? One who shames the miserliness of the man's brothers, his fellow countrymen. The good Samaritan stops, takes the man under his care, and then puts him up at an inn under his own expense. That is grace in action. That's gospel generosity to those in need. But as we do that, it can be tempting to compare what we're doing with everyone else. Because in our world, we do it to compete with one another, don't we? We compare ourselves to each other. Is that what we do in a culture of grace? Well, no. And so our third point, comparison culture meets a culture of grace. Have a look at verses four and five. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor, for each will have to bear his own load. The final verse then shifts the focus from the other to our own service of God, our works. Works do not save us, but they are an integral part of the Christian life. What are works in this context? Well, what we've just been talking about. Helping brothers and sisters trapped in sin, being gospelly generous with those in need. There are other things too, but those are the two that we've just been given. And they do have a place in a culture of grace. A culture of grace doesn't mean that we don't do anything. I mean, there's a tribe of Christianity that almost seems allergic to doing anything good, just in case it might be seen to be promoting salvation by works or the social gospel. Do nothing lest you be tempted to trust in your own works. But that's not the Christianity of the Bible. We were remade in Christ to do good. It's just doing good doesn't save us. But there are dangers to be avoided as we do good. And that is the sideways look. I'm struggling this week with the sideways look because my neck is, is, I woke up with a dodgy neck partway through the week. But this, you have to imagine I'm looking sideways, okay? The sideways glance. What is everyone else doing? Well, imagine, for example, we had the Apostle Peter in our church this morning. He's just been reinstated into the, the church after his denial of Jesus. And Jesus has told him to go feed his sheep. That is to be his work, his ministry, his service to God. Peter then sees the Apostle Paul. Got a lot of visitors this morning, haven't we? But uh, sees the Apostle Paul and replies, Lord, what about this man? Imagine that in a culture of legalism. What does a culture of legalism say? What about this man? Well, yes, watch this man's works. Compare his works to yours. Feel bad if you don't match up or feel smug when you see him fail. 
Criticize his works and make sure he knows you're watching. Thank God that you're not like them, that person, such a lazy, pathetic sinner. Sounds almost like the Pharisee and the Pharisee of the tax collector, doesn't it? That's what a culture of work says. Yes, look at them. What does a culture of license say? Yep, that's a fair point. If he's not doing anything, don't feel obligated to do anything yourself. I mean, it's not worth it if everyone's not pulling their weight, is it? And, and if they are, if everyone's pulling their weight, you're probably not needed. If John's out there feeding the sheep, then what's the point of you doing it too? You'd never do it as well as him, so just let him get on with it. You don't want to stand out as different from everyone else, so just aim for mediocre. It's all for the people watching anyway, isn't it? So make sure that you look busy when they're watching. That's what a culture of license says, isn't it? But what about a culture of grace? Well, Paul tells us again, verse 4, let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. The emphasis here is not on the word test, but on the word own. Test his own works. The word test here can also be translated approve or interpret or discern. So he's saying look at, focus, keep your eye on what you're doing in God's service, Paul is saying. Not on what someone else is doing. Each person has his own work to do. Everyone has to bear his own load. The word there for load is not the same word as burden in verse 1. There the word burden means a crushing weight. Here it's just the word for something that you carry. You've got your own work to do. You'll be answerable to your master for what you've done, not the person next to you. So much of our culture is based on comparison though now, isn't it? Through social media, through influencers, through the general media as well. It's hard not to go along with that sort of looking what everyone else is doing. And so often we deny grace to ourselves because we perceive that we're not as worthy as the others. You know, their lives look so sorted and, and we could never be like so and so. We could never live a perfect life like what's her name. But Paul is saying here that the comparison game has no place in a culture of grace. When we compare ourselves to others, we set ourselves up to fail or we set ourselves up to boast and feel smug. And it's not based on the inherent value of what we've done, is it, when we compare? But actually it's based on how well or badly everyone else is doing. We end up feeling better when others in the kingdom do their work badly. And we end up feeling glum when they do it well because it makes us look bad. Think about how twisted that system is where we end up rejoicing in people doing it badly and sad when people do things well for the Lord. Now a culture of grace encourages us not to judge the work of others, but to look to our own. That we might rejoice. That's what that word boast means there. Rejoice in our works and the works of others. That's why Paul can write in Philippians 1, uh, verse 18, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. You see, there are others going about even causing trouble for him. He's not bothered about comparing himself to them. He's only bothered that the gospel is going out. And he can rejoice that it's been, uh, he, the, because he's been set free, not from the prison, but from comparing himself to others. It's a culture of grace that means he can rejoice, even of the work in other people who are out there trying to hurt him. So what happens with the Apostle Peter? Well, Jesus challenges his comparison mindset. John 21, verse 22, Jesus said to him, what is that? Uh, sorry, Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Instead of comparing himself to others, Peter's was to get on with following Jesus for himself. That's not to say that Peter was not to be concerned with how everyone else was doing. Peter was to feed the sheep. That involved the well-being of the sheep. But not concerned in a way that meant that he was measuring his own service by what everyone else was doing. A culture of grace means we don't judge one another in that way. Romans 14 
Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands and falls. Or in verse 12, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. God is our master, and it's him ultimately that we're accountable to. Yes, there's a role for accountability here on earth. Yes, there's a role for others to encourage one another to serve the Lord with all their energy and zeal. But in the end, before the Lord, we bear our own load. We don't need to compare ourselves to others. We don't need to judge others. Because as we said at the beginning, it's all about grace. Whatever the legalists want to tell us, what the live life as you want to, people want to tell us, grace means that we don't need to compare ourselves. We don't need to look down on others or feel good about, uh, to feel good about ourselves. Because grace tells us that we're freely loved by God. And that frees us up to live a culture of grace. Loving others because we've first been loved. And helping those who struggle with sin. Bearing one another's leads and serving one another in love. Well, let's pray that God will give us the strength to do that this week. And in the days and years and decades ahead, let's pray. Father God, thank you that it's all about grace. Father, thank you that we're saved by grace. And Father, thank you that we live by grace. Father, we do pray that in our church we would foster a culture of grace where we love one another, where we help those who are in need, who are caught in sin or are going through a difficult time. And Father, we pray that you'd help us in the midst of all that, not to compare ourselves with each other and to avoid that sideways glance. And instead, look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and press on and keep going. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.